Hello, and welcome back to the second half of Lecture 28, the second video accompanying Lecture 28, where we're going to continue to talk about gravitational potential energy with universal gravitation, right? Okay, so let's take a look at a very astronomical type of example, which would be typical of universal gravitation. So in this problem, example three, we're going to consider a small comet in the Oort cloud. Look that up, it's a cool, cool idea. Um, this is found at the edge of the solar system. Oh, excuse me, there we go. That is 25,000 astronomical units away. An astronomical unit is about um, half or um, well, 0.15 trillion meters, all right? Or 1.5 times 10 to the 11 meters. Okay, um, it's at rest, okay? It's gonna be approximately at rest, so it's suspended in deep space, so, you know, solar system deep space. All right, and it's got a mass of about six and a half million kilograms. Okay, so part A, how much work will the gravitational force exerted by the sun do on this comet by the time the comet crashes into the sun? All right, so this is a thing. This is like, you know, when comets come and they, they don't come back for a long time. That's because what happens is they really, this we think they are a bunch of comets, millions or trillions of them in this spherical area, um, very, 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 very loosely packed, right? You know, probably millions of miles apart. And they're essentially at rest, but then the slightest, slightest bump will push them off. This would be a bump from another star, if you can imagine how small that gravitational force is. But they have, there's almost nothing else opposing it. So a tiny force would create a tiny acceleration, but then it would move. And then once it go, you know, moves out of some sort of stable equilibrium, then it's just going to fall towards the sun, slowly at first, and then quicker and quicker and quicker eventually passing into the intersolar system, crossing this thing called the frost line, where you can have liquid water on the surface. And that's when they start to boil away because comets are mostly made out of, um, of frozen hydrogen compounds, a lot of H2O. And they, that's it, that's where you get the comet's tail, you know, and then that comet's not gonna come back for forever, maybe, or for thousands of years, all right? Tens of thousands of years, or more frequently, depending on, you know, kind of what orbit they end up in. Okay, so that's, a little bit of the background. Okay, so we need the work done by gravity to equal the negative of the change in potential energy, okay? So in this case, we're gonna have a U final and U initial. Notice here that neither U final nor U initial is zero, okay? So U initial is going to be gravitational constant, let me zoom in a bit on this, gravitational constant, mass of the sun, mass of the comet, and the initial distance between the two. The initial distance is 25,000 astronomical units. By the way, astronomical unit is the, dis the average distance between the Earth and the sun. Okay, so this is this comet is 25,000 times further from the sun than we are, okay, um, on average. And so that ends up being 3.73 times 10 to the 15 meters, all right? And then we, could, we would then calculate the U final in a similar way, except we would use the radius of the sun, okay? Because this is a comet that isn't gonna do a flyby, it's gonna crash right into the sun, okay? Which is actually unlikely, all right? And I have to have very, very, um, particular con initial conditions to do that. Okay. All right, so then our work done by gravity takes this form, right? See how we have an initial negative? Because the comet's still in the gravitational well, just not much, right? It's near the edge of the well. And then we have the final, I'm sorry, here's the, here's the initial, where it's at the edge of the well. And here's the much larger in magnitude, but much more negative, so at the bottom of the well, final gravitational potential energy. Okay, work done by gravity is gonna be the negative of the two. Okay, so I'm gonna clean that up a little bit, right? And then I'm gonna find, so then I found there that if I switch out the negatives, look what comes. U final becomes, so it's U final, I guess it makes actually, it works out fine here. And it's because U final minus U initial simplifies just one over RS minus one over R naught. Well, here's the interesting thing, right? So one over RS is dividing by a much larger number. Okay, so this is this is a, this is a, um, let's see, so we're dividing, uh, excuse me, we're dividing by a much smaller number here. RS is much, much smaller in magnitude than R naught. And so then this is going to be a bigger number than this one, which gives us a positive. So you can see that, positive. And it should be a positive because the work done by gravity while being pulled into the sun is positive work because the angle between the displacement and the force is parallel, zero degrees, cosine of zero is one, positive one, okay? All right, so we got the number of joules, quite a bit, right? 10 and 18. We've got a million, a million trillion joules of energy, 
being done on this comet as it falls towards the sun. Okay? Okay, so then using conservation of energy, assuming an initial kinetic energy of zero, we should then definitely be able to find K final. All right, so I set this up again. Okay, and honestly, I, I'm not even sure why I didn't just use the, uh, the work kinetic energy, um, you know, why I just didn't use W equals delta K. Instead, I kind of I re recalculate U initial and U final. Um, I think I do it just because then I can set up a, a general expression. So rather than just, you know, just using the numerical answer, I wanted a, another one that's just dependent on the final radius, the initial radius, okay, masses. Okay, um, and notice um, that here we have three masses, right? Because we've got, um, oh, I don't know why I said that. We have two, and I actually should have canceled these out. So that, that, is, that is an honest, honest mistake. I really, there's no reason to leave them in there, okay? Um, so it's, it's independent of the mass of the comet, the final velocity. It absolutely should be. Um, think about it, because mass shows up in all the expressions, so it's independent. Any object, any comet, I guess, that was out at this distance would have the same final velocity if it crashed into the sun. And it's pretty fast, right? So we're going 617, or 617,000 meters per second. 617,000 meters per second, about half a million meters per second. Um, it's not, you know, it's not anywhere close to like speed of light fast, but it's fast, okay? Right? A lot of energy out there, fast moving objects, and they fall very, very, very long distances. All right, let's look at a couple more. So here, um, I left off some units, so notice that I give you zero, a hypothet hypothetical planet. It has a mass in kilograms of five times 10 to the 23. All right, so kind of similar to Earth. It's got a radius of about half Earth, three times 10 to the six meters. All right, no atmosphere. Um, it's got, so we don't have to worry about any drag. A 10 kilogram space probe is relaunched vertically from its surface. If the probe, part A, is launched with an initial, um, initial energy, so launch energy, of 50 million joules, what will be its kinetic energy when it is 4 million um, meters from the center of zero? Right, so here I left off the meters again, excuse me. If the probe is to achieve a maximum distance of 8 million meters from the center of zero, with what initial kinetic energy must it be launched from the surface of zero? Okay, so, so here at four, it's asking for, um, it's asking for um, you know, what, you know, how much kinetic energy is left over, right? Because we started with 50 million, how much is left over when it's at this height? We're probably, if, if we've got a negative value, then it's a bad question because it's kind of a trick question because then you could say, well, it actually never made it to that height. But that's not the way this problem works out. It, it's a positive value, there is leftover kinetic energy. Um, but it turns out it's not enough leftover kinetic energy to make it another 2 million meters. So we'll find out in part B, this actually will get a larger value than 50 million joules, okay? Um, I, don't, I don't know exactly how high that 50 million joules of kinetic energy, because it's not asking the problem I didn't solve for it, how high that would get you, but it, get, it would get you somewhere between four and eight, okay? And, we'll, and when we see the numbers, I, I can speculate more specifically, okay? So we're gonna use conservation of energy, just E1 equals E2, all right? This is gonna take the form, right, of kinetic plus potential, so straightforward energy conservation there. Um, K initial minus U initial looks like this, okay, plus U initial, excuse me. But of course, U initial is in the well, so it's negative. All right, and then we got our K2 and then our U2 or U final, also negative, still in the well, because in this case, we're well, both cases, we're well within the well. We've just gone up a little bit, yeah, well within the well. All right, um, so then I'm just gonna solve for how much leftover kinetic energy there is, right? Here are the radiuses that we were given, all right? See how that simplifies very nicely. Plug in all the numbers and we're left with 22 um, million joules, all right? So, all right? so we can see there then um, that it's definitely, you know, so we can, we can see here that 22 million is, um, well, it's, you know, it's, a, it's significantly more, but I, I, don't, I don't know if that's, again, I don't know if that's enough to make it to, to eight. It might be, I don't know actually, because in this case, if we think about it, then we'd have um, you only needed 3.8 in order to get to that height. We only need um, 38 million joules because we have that much left over. Okay, um, so in other words, it's still in motion. And we could solve for the velocity, we're not asked to, um, but we easily could, especially since we we're given the mass. Okay, um, okay, so now we're in, in this case, we're gonna have a, a, a final kinetic energy of zero because in this case, we're specifically told, you know, we have a maximum distance. So this is getting up to the top of the toss, momentarily coming to rest and falling back down. Just like, you know, we're used to kinematics, toss the ball up there, reaches the top, comes back down. It's just now we're going really high. So our potential energy has changed form. That's really the difference here. 
All right, so then I'm just gonna solve for the initial kinetic energy this time. Notice with the initial kinetic energy, um, we have an expression that looks um, you know, like so, all right? And get the numbers, and we end up needing, yeah, so it is less, less than 8,000. So 69,000, or 69 million, excuse me, 69 million joules. All right, cool, about 70 million joules. Okay, so that's a, again, just getting an idea of what um, gravitational potential energy problems look like in the context of energy conservation. All right, one more real fast. Okay, so this is a, a system where we're gonna be moving object around and recalculating its gravitational potential energy. All right, so um, in this case, we're assuming that mass B starts from rest and ends at rest. And in this case, we have three spheres. That's what's new about it, because we'll have to calculate the gravitational potential energy for both of them. Um, we're given all of their masses. They're all just a few kilograms. Um, their centers are on a common line, just centimeters apart. And then we're going to move B from here to here. So it starts at distance D from A, and it ends at distance D from C, and the distance between A and C is L. Okay? And so then the question is, how much work is done on sphere B? So this is an interesting type of problem because we actually don't know the sign right away of what the work would be by gravity on B. Because um, actually, well, in this case, how much work is done on B? So that's by you on B, you being the external force. You know, so is it positive? Are we doing positive work to move from this location to this location? Or are we doing negative work? Well, it depends, right? So if we're, if we're moving from the larger object towards the lower, towards the smaller object, then we actually would be doing positive, we would be doing, um, let's see, in that case, the gravitational, um, the force would point one way, and the displacement would point that, yeah. So actually, the applied force would always be positive work, excuse me, so the applied, the applied force would always be positive work, because we're always the displacement, you know, the F external is always gonna agree with the displacement because it's driving the displacement, okay? But what about gravity, right? Well, it depends what, what's the net direction of gravity, right? Because the F net G could point that way or it could point this way in a two-body system like this. But in this case, it happens to point towards A because A is the bigger body, okay? So let's run through it. So here is our initial um, potential energy, all right? Notice there's, there's two things pulling on it. So this is the potential energy from um, A, you see that there? And then this term right here is potential energy from C and they're both acting on B. So this is the initial potential energy of B, not the entire system, just of B. If we, need, if we wanted the initial potential energy of the entire system, we'd have to include the gravitational pull between A and C. It doesn't matter in the problem, so I leave it out. Okay, U finals and have a very similar form, but just look, the denominators have changed. Okay, take note. All right, so then the external work is just the change in potential energy. Notice it's not the work done by gravity. This is the work on B, all right, and it's equal to the change, okay? And so here we have work equals U final minus U initial. Plug in all the values, do some algebra, all right? So basically, um, there's, these can be like terms, right? If we just switch the order of them, and that would be just, just if I factor a, a negative out of this term, then it would become, actually, this, if I factor a negative out of this term, so I have a negative in front of the MC, then it would look just like this, wouldn't it? And so then that's what, that's what I do. This becomes my like term, and I factor out of MA minus MC, remember? Because I factored the negative, okay? So two steps of factor. Factor a negative, factor the sum, okay? Then um, clean it up a little bit more by doing a common denominator, plug in the values, and we get um, five times 10 to the negative seven joules, okay? So this is positive work. This is how much work it would take to move B from there to there, okay? And then the work done by gravity just has to equal the negative. Why? Well, because delta K is zero, and remember, Work net equals delta K. So that means that only two works in the system is the work done by the external force and the work done by gravity. Those are the, you know, the two works in the entire system of by, because there's only two forces in the system. There has to be two forces because otherwise there'd be a change in kinetic energy. And there it is. There's the work done by gravity, which is this negative five times 10 to the negative seven joules. Okay. All right, so hopefully these examples give you a good idea along with the homework of what to expect for universal gravitational potential energy problems. And I've left uh, one for practice for you, which is a variation that does involve kinetic energy of the example you just saw. All right, thank you for watching.